<laughs> but it is good to be together this Sunday morning. It's good to have you guys here to be able to worship together. A few announcements before we begin. Coming up uh, next Tuesday, Tuesday, July 16th, is one of our Front Yard Fellowships. It is a great opportunity to just come and hang out as a church, um, to be able to spend time together, eat together, maybe play a game together, maybe talk together. There are cards and a beautiful Vanna White over there to show you where the cards are. Um, <laughs> If you guys would be willing, and if you're planning on coming, we invite you to grab one of these cards and give it to someone. Kelly, I'm speaking right now. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> get, I know. We're allowed to do stuff like this today. Uh, give it to someone you know, someone you care about, someone you don't know super well, but you pass every day, and invite them to know what the church can be like, what the church community can be like. So we have these over. Can you show them again, Steve? Um, there it is. We have these over here. We invite you to take a couple and hand them out. Also coming up, we have a summer new members class, August 10th through 11th. So if you've been attending here for a little while and want to know more about what membership can be like, we invite you to come and check that out. We have something that I'm very excited about, a Waze devotional. I don't know if you guys have seen this before. Probably you've heard it talk to death. Um, but we have been going through our 25 ways that our staff and session uh, drew out from Scripture to say these are the ways that God is calling us to live out our lives. And what's difficult is you might hear the way on Sunday morning, but then you go back into the rest of your life, and I would imagine by Friday afternoon, you don't remember what the way of the week is. And so what we've made is a daily devotional that each day will link a scripture passage with a thought and with a prayer focus on that way so that you can see it from different angles and be encouraged to live it out your life in a new way. We also partnered with a local graphic designer who was able to design some of the images in this, and all proceeds, we're, we're asking for a $10 donation for them. It's a five-week devotional. All proceeds go to build up our prayer ministry here at FPC. So if that's something that you would like, we're selling them or, or asking for donations for them right afterwards. If you don't want to buy one, if you don't have $10 on you, but what you really want is a book, just take a book. $10 isn't worth uh, holding you from something that could be worthwhile for your spiritual life. And that prayer ministry that we are building and those proceeds are going towards is having a day of prayer. And that's coming up on Saturday, July 13th, where we're coming here at 8.30 in the morning. We're going to have a, a light breakfast, and then we're going to walk around Moorestown and be in prayer for our community, caring for them. One of the best ways that we can reach out to our community is to be sure that we are raising them before God together. And so if you are free that Saturday, or maybe you're busy but you want to move your plans, that's Saturday at 8.30, July 13th. It's a time for us as a church to be in prayer for our community and cover them with a river of prayer. And if you can't make it then, or if you are looking for another opportunity to be in prayer, um, we are having another prayer the day after, on July 14th. Um, for those of you who know the Laundress family, uh, they were longtime members of our church. Katie Laundress recently fell off of a horse and broke her spine and is paralyzed. And so they are coordinating a day of prayer, a time of prayer. We're going to meet here at the church, and we're going to take buses over to McGee Rehab Center, and we're going to walk around McGee and be in prayer to God for him to do miraculous things or for him to do mundane things, whatever it is that his will is to be providing for and caring for that family. Mm -hmm. So that's on Saturday. You can find that and more announcements in this week's, uh, actually these two weeks, Connections. I invite you guys to grab one of those at some point. Um, and look over some of the things that are going on in the life of our church. But with that, let's worship God together. Amen. Could you stand with us? As the darkness fades into new beginnings as we lift our eyes to a hope beyond all creation waits with an expectation to declare the reign of the lord our god we will not be moved when the earth gives way for the risen one is overcome and for every fear there's an empty grave for the risen one is overcome 
as the silence breaks in the name of Jesus as the heavens cry let the earth respond all creation shouts with the voice of triumph to declare the reign of the Lord our God we will not be moved when the earth gives way for the risen one is overcome and for every fear there's an empty grave for the risen one is overcome shall reign forever strongholds now surrender for the Lord our God is overcome who can be against us Jesus our defender he is Lord and he has overcome he shall reign forever strongholds now surrender for the Lord our God has overcome who can be against us Jesus our defender he is Lord and he will overcome we will not be moved when the earth gives way for the risen one is overcome and for every fear there's an empty grave for the risen one is overcome we will not be moved when the earth gives way for the risen one is overcome and for every fear there's an empty grave for the risen one is overcome Amen He has overcome Amen Praise the Lord love that came for us humble to a sinner's cross you broke my shame and sinfulness rose again victoria faithfulness None can deny Through the storm And through the fire There is truth That sets me free Jesus Christ Who lives in me You are stronger You are stronger Sin is broken, you have saved me. It is written, Christ is risen. Jesus, you are Lord of all. No beginning and no end. You're my hope defense you came to see and save the lost 
you paid it all upon the cross you are stronger you are stronger sin is broken you have saved me it is written christ is risen jesus you are lord of all yes you are you are lord of all So let your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher, be lifted higher. So let your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher, be lifted higher. So let your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher, be lifted higher. So let the name be lifted higher, be lifted higher, be lifted higher. You are stronger, you are stronger, sin is broken, you have saved me. It is risen, Christ is risen, yes Jesus you are Lord of all. You are stronger, yes, you are stronger. Sin is broken, you have saved me. It is written, Christ is risen. Jesus, you are Lord of all. Scripture says that Jesus said, What shall profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? Which was a rhetorical question because there's nothing that you can do to regain your soul, regardless of what you have or what you do. But God loved us so much that he gave the most precious thing, and that was his son, to bring us to himself to save us, to save our souls. Amen? Amen. Amen. Savior, I come, quiet my soul, remember. Everything I once held dear, I count it all as lost. Lead me to the cross where your love poured out. Bring me to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. Rid me of myself, I belong to you. So lead me, lead me to the cross. You were as I, tempted and tried. You, man. The Word became flesh for my sin and death. Now you're risen. And everything I once held dear, I count it all 
all have lost. Lead me to the cross where your love poured out. Bring me to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. Rid me of myself, I belong to you. So lead me, lead me to the cross. To your heart, to your heart, lead me to your heart, so lead me to your heart, so lead me to the cross where your love poured out bring me to my knees lord i lay me down rid me of myself i belong to you so lead me lead me and lead me to the cross where your love poured out Lead me to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. Rid me of myself, Lord, I belong to you. So lead me, lead me to the cross. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As we enter into this time of confession, I invite all of us to earnestly bring our whole selves to our gracious and loving God. Father, you have continually come to us and chased after us since the beginning. You have sought to show us your love and care in a close-knit relationship, yet we routinely turn away. We confess that you have thought of, we thought of you as distant and disconnected. Often we have done our best to separate your presence from our daily lives instead of inviting, inviting you in. Though you are closer than our very breath and your spirit lives within us, we confess that we have gone through days or even weeks without noticing your presence. Lord, hear us as we silently confess our sins to you. Amen. Sisters and brothers, here is the good news. You are not saved because we are not saved because we are good, but because God is good. In Jesus, we are made right with God. In him, we are united with one another. The Spirit, the person of God, dwells in us. Nothing we have done can earn this, but it is God's free gift to us. Take it and rejoice. Now, Let's greet one another in the love and joy of Christ by saying to one another, the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Communication with the outside world. 
Uh, can I get any, uh, let's just go with anyone who considers themselves a kid. You can come on up. That's what I'm talking about. I knew that was coming. Nice. Uh, are there any kids in the room who want to come up front for a kid's time? Just me and you. I like this. We got one more coming. Come on. Come on. Anybody else? That's fine. It's fair. I didn't shower today. Come on up. Come on. All right. So here's my question to you. And it's probably a difficult question for Sunday morning when you're a little bit tired. But which one of you thinks that you're the strongest? <laughs> the two of you? All right, between the two of you, which one of you thinks that you're the strongest? Oh, both of you. OK, here's what we're going to do. Um, what's your name, bud? Bryce. Bryce. Bryce, can you come on up? Grab a seat, Bryce. Bryce, between the two of us, who do you think is the strongest, me or you? <laughs> me? OK. <laughs> Bryce, do you think if you and I were to arm wrestle right now, you would win or I would win? You would win. Okay, let's go. Bryce, Bryce, come here. Bryce, we're going to arm wrestle right now. This is happening. I don't even know how to arm wrestle. Okay, Bryce, lie down right here. Lie down right here. All right, and now you're going to hold my hand with your hand and put your elbow on the ground, and you're going to try and push my hand to the ground like that. All right, ready? You think you're going to win? Yeah. All right, you're going to push... It's hard. Look, you got a whole group of people cheering for you. Ready? Uh, can I? So, can someone ready, set, go for us? Were you ready? Uh, you wanna do it, ready? Set, go. go. I won. I'm so, <laughs> I take no joy in that, but I won, Bryce. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is not going to be something I'm going to write home about. All right. Here's the other question. All of you guys together. So Bryce couldn't beat me. Bryce, I'm sorry. Maybe in like 20 years, you'll be able to take me. Hi. Hi. But, <laughs> nice. But do you think all of you together might be able to beat me in an arm wrestle? Yeah. All right, why don't you all come on over here? Yeah. I'm going to hold my arm right here, and your job is to push it to the ground. Ready? It, you just reach in. Anyone who can reach in can grab my hand. You, if you want to get over here, you can use your body weight. Gosh, I wish I had worked out. <laughs> Ready, set, go. <laughs> Good job, guys. So here's what I want you guys to remember. Between, between Bryce and I, which one of us was stronger? Me. <laughs> Bryce, I love the confidence, bud. Right between the two of us, I was stronger. But when Bryce had a bunch of friends help him out, who was stronger? Oliver. All of you were stronger. And we come every week to church. And this church is a family that we get to get together with. And there are people who will Hulk smash. Maybe not. But they're a family who gets together and we're stronger together. There are people in this room who care about you and who love you and are there for you. And so what I want you guys to remember is that when you come to church, when you come to church, you have the ability to be cared for by people who can help you be stronger. So if there's something going on in your life, if there's something that's hard, if you're struggling with a math test, if you're struggling with something going on at home, you guys have the ability to talk to someone here and we can be stronger together. Do you guys want to pray with me? Let's pray this morning. Would you repeat after me? Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus thank, you for the church, thank you for the church that we can be stronger together. That we can be stronger together. In your name we pray. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for joining me up front and for beating me in an arm wrestle. I'm really glad that that's on videotape right now. You're welcome for teaching your kids a new challenge. I th are we okay back there? No? Okay. All right. Um, we're going to take care of our, friend, our friends in the corner. Something just fell, a sound panel just fell off our wall. That is scary. Yeah. Yeah, it just fell off the wall. Okay. All right. We just want to make sure everyone's okay. That's scary when there's a loud noise and definitely need to look at that. Okay. All right. Thanks very much, everyone. 
Yeah, we can leave that on the floor. It's totally okay. We want to make sure our, our friends are, are, are well. Okay. All right, that may be, this is a time of prayer. That may be something we need to pray for right there, that moment. Okay. As we continue to worship this morning, this is a time called the prayers of the people where we get to bring, the same way we brought our full selves to that moment of confession, this is a time when we get to bring our full selves to each other and to God. And as we'll hear from Dan, who's preaching a wonderful sermon on Ecclesiastes 4 this morning, it's on the word with. What does it mean for God to be with us and for us? And in that same way, we get to be with each other and for each other right here, right now through prayer. And so I wanted to let you know a couple ways that you can be with people in prayer um, today. We're sending two letters of well-wishing to two friends of the congregation. One is going to a young man named Yusuf Gabar. He is a relative of Joyce Peacock's. We all know Joyce loves prayer and has been really uh, instrumental in encouraging our church to pray. Yusuf is a relative of hers, and he was in a serious motorcycle accident. Um, he's okay. He is recovering, but it is going to be a very long road, and he suffered some really serious physical injuries. And right now, emotionally, mentally, it's taking a toll on him as well. So if you sign your name on that letter, that will be a huge encouragement to Yusuf, and keep him in your prayers, please. We're also sending a letter of well-wishing to Robert Gwynn. He suffered the death of his wife recently, and Robert is Ginny Pas Pasinante's brother. So we're sending two letters to those dear friends today. Also, I'd like to ask you to keep two more families in your prayers. One is uh, Roger and Polly Graham. They live right next door in the Evergreen, now called the Axe, um, retirement home right over there. Roger was admitted into the hospital, I believe, on Friday, the end of last week. And so we want to keep him in our prayers. And also, please remember the Hieronymus family. We've been praying for um, Alicia's, Hieronymus's mom. Her mom's name is Candy. And Candy's been battling cancer for a very long time and passed away yesterday morning on Saturday. So it's been a long road for this family, and that is, that's an exhausting thing for all involved. So please keep Roger Graham and the Hieronymuses in your prayers as well. Are there any other prayer requests, things we can lift up, sorrows or joys that we would like to celebrate? All are absolutely worth voicing here as a church family. Yes, Becca. Um, my brother and sister-in-law's next-door neighbor, Donna, was in a very bad accident in Bermuda on Monday. Um, <coughs> suffered a compound fracture of her leg. Um, she finally got home on Thursday, but now she's in the hospital because they didn't give her enough antibiotics, and she's got a very bad infection. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, we have a, a dear friend named Donna. If you didn't hear that, she was in a bad accident in Bermuda. The doctors were able to receive some treatment while there, but had to be flown home for surgeries and is fighting an infection because of that. So thank you. We'll, we'll be praying for Donna, absolutely. Any other things worth celebrating or, or prayer requests that people would like to lift up in prayer this morning? All right. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Derek. Yeah, so Yes, yeah. Um, he got sent home on palliative care. He's not recovering as well as they hoped. And uh, so just prayers for healing and for his family to go through. Thank, and his, Brian is his name? Brian. Yeah. Brian, okay. He had surgery, brain surgery, a few weeks ago. A couple, uh, about a month. About a so month, okay. About a month ago and is receiving treatment for that. And that's a long road. That's a really difficult surgery. So for Don and for Brian. Friends, let's go to God in prayer. Oh, holy God, thank you that you are a God who is with us, that we call you Emmanuel, not just during Christmas, but that you are God with us throughout all of time, past, present, and future, that you are for us. We thank you that you are the same God that parted the Red Seas, that drew Moses out of the water, and we know that you are the God who draws us out of deep places of water and overwhelm when we feel like we are being drowned by life circumstance. God, we thank you that you are bigger than any one of us, that you, like Dan said, you are, you are bigger than even our own arm muscles, right? That, God, you are love, and you are grace, and you are mercy, and those are more powerful forces than any human strength. And so today we come before you to rest in that knowledge that you are merciful, and you are good, and that you delight in us. 
And so, God, we lift up our friends like Roger Graham and the Hieronymus family. We lift up Yusuf and we lift up Robert Gwynn, all people who are in a stage of life where they are dealing with uncertain circumstances, with diagnoses, with losses, um, with recoveries, um, and we pray for Donna as well. Lord, we pray that you will be with our friends, that you won't just walk with them, that you will heal them, that you will encourage their minds and their bodies and their spirits, that you will give the doctors wisdom where it, will, it is needed, and that you will also renew and re-energize the spirits of our friends that we love, and those around them to not only care for them, but to maybe even bring them a glimpse of joy and a glimpse of your hope at this time. And God, because we are the body of Christ here, we are just one representation of that around the world. And so we pray for your church, O oh God, especially in places like Europe, in China, in Sri Lanka, in the Middle East. We pray for our mission partners in places like Mexico and in Haiti, in Kenya, in Greece, in India, in Japan. Lord, we are your diverse children all over the world who seek to not only know your love personally, but to give it to those we encounter wherever we may be. And so I pray that through the Holy Spirit, you will revive us, you will refresh us, you will give us new life so that we can continue to serve your purposes and serve your church, O oh God. We also thank you for local missions right here like the Children's Fresh Air Home and for our staff and volunteers this week that will be going to Wildwood, Wildwood New Jersey um, to simply love on kids who don't get time to just be free, to know your love, to experience nature and explore the outdoors who might never have even seen the shore before. And so, God, may they be free in your image and know your love deeply through this experience at the Fresh Air Home. And also bless IHN as our volunteers here prepare next week to receive uh, new families and friends who for whatever reason are in a time of transition between homes. And God, I feel that they may not just feel like welcome guests here, that they may feel deep belonging and deep love through us here, that our hospitality may be so radical and so authentic that they feel that they can bring their full selves to us and therefore to you, O oh God. We also pray for our friends and family in the military who are serving within this country but also around the world, God. We ask that you might guard their hearts and minds through your Holy Spirit so that no matter what or who they may face, they may find themselves rooted in your divine love and your divine wisdom, God. We also pray that you may bless our elected officials at every level and especially for our pastors and our church leaders. Today we remember our friends at First Baptist Church and our uh, friend, Reverend Linda Pepe, the associate pastor, Reverend Jennifer Bradley. And we thank you for our church leaders here, for our Sunday school teachers, for our deacons, our trustees, our elders, and every single man, woman, and child who seriously gives them themselves in, in any capacity to love you, to serve you, and to bring your gospel of truth and hope and life to, to friends, to neighbors, to this community. And be with those who are receiving letters of well-wishing, for they need your love and your mercy in real ways, right here, right now. God, we lift up all these prayers that are spoken, but also know we carry unspoken sorrows as well in our own hearts, and we lift those up to you too. And we do it all praying boldly as your Son taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the power, kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And friends, I do want to just point your attention. As you know, the prayer wall is always there for you on your right. We pray over those confidentially every Tuesday, so please feel free at any point in the service to use that. And also, we are moving our way of the week to right here to during our time of prayer, after our time of prayer. And it's simply a way where we get to be reminded of we, how important prayer is to keep ourselves in prayer, to keep our friends in prayer, but also what does it mean to be God's light in this world? 
And we went through the first round of the ways, and now we're beginning our second round of the ways. And if those, if that's a, if something you're not familiar with, like Dan mentioned, there's a wonderful devotional that really gets you in touch with those that takes five minutes that you can sit down at your desk and read that at the office or simply uh, as you're drinking your coffee in the morning. So this way of the week, it's B third. It's way number one, and it says this. God is first, others are second, and you're third. Don't just think about your own interests, but be interested in others. Don't think less of yourself, just think of yourself less and others more. And I think that's a really, full, really powerful practice that we get to engage in this week. And it starts right here, right now, because tithing and, and giving of our offering, that's not something that's just a biblical teaching. It's something that changes lives. And in the same way that God is open to our needs and our hurts, like we just lifted up those prayers, we also, it's important as the church to really model that image of Christ, to be open to the needs and the hurts of others. So that's what offering is about. So now I'd like to invite the ushers forward to receive our morning offering. Sing along with us if you know this song. Light of the world, you stepped out into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life filled with you. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Days so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for love's sake became poor. So here I am to worship, here I am. To say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. And I'll never know how much it costs. To see my sin upon that cross, and I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that Yes, I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that Yes, I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. So here I am to here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me.
Yeah. Uh, I don't think there's ever been better praise than that. That was awesome. Um, I'm assuming that yay was for me. Um, so it's, go it's good to see you guys here this Sunday morning. Uh, over the past five-ish years, five or so years, emerging adults have referred to the process of becoming adult and small actions that are adult actions with a, with a pretty wonderful word. Uh, Jess? Adulting. The word is adulting. Um, it's a great word. It's a, it's a word that's used to describe when you do something that you would never have done as a kid, but now that you're an adult, you do it. And if you look up phrases uh, or tweets uh, that have been said about adulting, you come with um, some pretty pithy and remar remarkable statements about what being an adult is like. One, one of the comments you'll read is, um, you know you're an adult when the most exciting activity of your evening is shopping for lawn chairs, right? <laughs> There's a bunch of adults in this room who are like, I could use a good lawn chair, right? One of my personal favorites is, I just got a Costco membership. Hashtag adulting. Because, because literally there's nothing that says adult more than buying things in bulk at a discount, right? Like that is, that is the quintessential moment of adulthood is when you buy 87 rolls of toilet paper because they're four cents cheaper a roll, right? And, and there are all these little moments that signify to people that they are an adult. And whether it's one of those or it's something like paying your taxes, which is no one's favorite adult moment, or it's like buying a new dishwasher that you some, for some reason are really excited about, even though it just washes dishes, or uh, you've bought a house, we have these moments that signify to people that they're adults. And, and when studying this line between childhood or adolescence and adulthood, Dr. Jeffrey Arnett uh, surveyed a bunch of emerging adults, people uh, between 18 and 29, to discover the, the things that people said make a person an adult. And across the board, Americans said three things. They said, a, an adult is someone who takes responsibility for their own actions. An adult is someone who makes independent decisions. And an adult is someone who is financially independent. You catching a little bit of a, a chain here, right? An adult in America, the way that we think of an adult is someone who is independent. We think of someone who makes their own decisions, expect, accepts responsibility for their own actions, and hopefully pays their own bills. Pretty simply, for Americans, the way that we think of an adult is someone who is able to take care of themselves. And yet, when you actually take the time to read scripture, you find that we get a very different definition of what a human adult is intended to be. Right at the beginning of scripture, and regardless of how you read it as history or a story that tells us about us and about God, you find this man, Adam. And though he was put in a perfect world and in a perfect relationship with God at the end of the day, he's lonely. This guy, Adam, is essentially his own boss. He doesn't really answer to anyone else. He is completely interpersonally independent because there aren't any other people, right? He does what he wants to do. He has all the power that any human could ever have. He names all the animals, and at the end of the day of naming all the animals, he looks around and it says, not a suitable helper could be found. Adam, even though he had all of the things that you could really ask for, was lonely because people aren't meant to be independent. At our very core, the human person is meant to be a communal person. And, and we find this right at the beginning, that we are made in the image of a God who is a perfect community unto himself. That Father, Son, and Spirit have existed for all eternity together, and we are made in that image as people who are intended to be with one another. And as we continue through our series on Ecclesiastes, today we'll be looking at Ecclesiastes 4, 4 through 12. And if you want to look it up in your phone, feel free. It'll be on the screen. I'll be saying it if you want to listen to me. Um, but what you find is throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, the teacher, the one who's speaking and teaching us, will say a lot of things that people chase after are elusive and mysterious as smoke. That pleasure, money, careers, achievement are all smoke that they are things that you try and grip onto, but no sooner do you grip them than they slip between your fingers. And yet when the teacher comes to talk about community and talk about companionship, he doesn't describe it as smoke. He doesn't describe it as vanity. When the teacher talks about companionship, he can only sing its praises. So would you read with me from Ecclesiastes 4, 4 through 12? I think it'll be on the screen, hopefully, because I think they use a different version here. Here's what it says. 
It says, then I observed that most people are motivated by success because they envy their neighbors. But this too is meaningless, like chasing the wind. Fools fold their idle hands, leading them to ruin. And yet, better to have one handful with quietness than two handfuls with hard work and chasing the wind. I observed yet another example of something meaningless under the sun. This is the case of a man who was all alone without a child or a brother, yet who works hard to gain as much wealth as he can. But then he asks himself, what am I working for? What am I giving up so much ple- why am I giving up so much pleasure now? It's all so meaningless and depressing. Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help, but someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. How can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. This is the word of the Lord. Would you pray with me? Lord, I pray that you would give us ears and hearts to hear your word. Lord, that they would not be my words, but yours, and they would sink in um, to make us the people, the community that you desire us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I don't know if you caught it, but I love this phrase that the teacher uses. He says, chasing after the wind. And it's just this, like, it's this beautiful word picture of chasing after something that you can never get. Like, what would you do if you caught the wind? Like, it's wind. It just goes right between your fingers, and it's the same image for chasing after the wind that gets used for the word that gets translated vanity or meaningless in most of our um, translations. This word vanity or meaningless actually has the idea of trying to grip onto smoke that when you see it, you can see that it's something that has shape, you can see that it's something that, that the light touches, and when you try and hold on to it, it runs right through your fingers. The teacher talks about this idea of chasing after the wind because humans have this proclivity to chase after things that are not theirs to hold on to. We have this desire to chase and grip onto things that are temporary and are fleeting, and it's like chasing after the wind. And, and, and he takes it a step further, and he says, um, not only is laziness folly, right? Because he talks about the lazy man who folds his arm and can do no work. But overwork and overachievement are also folly. A fool overworks and overachieves. And you can see at this moment where the teacher might have a few things to say to American culture, right? He says, the teacher says, better is one handful or one helping and rest then two handfuls and toil and chasing after the wind. Essentially, he says it's better to have enough and to have rest than to have excess and to be exhausted and toiling and overworked. And you can probably see again where the teacher would have an issue with American culture because we live in a world of two handfuls and toil, don't we? I mean, maybe this hits too close to home, but I was amazingly struck by how well that phrase describes the typical American work life. Two handfuls and toil. That we are people who are trying to achieve what cannot easily be achieved and hold on to what is by nature fleeting and we're trying to get more and hold on to it, but just as laziness is folly, overwork and overachievement are folly as well. They're chasing after the wind. And we live in that world of two handfuls and toil, right? That world where your work emails come on your home cell phone. In that world where you're taking a vacation, but you still got to get a little bit of work done, right? In that world where you don't really have time to sleep because you have a test coming tomorrow. We live in that world. And when it comes down to the fact that I can't tell you, right? I can't tell you how you might live out two handfuls and toil. I don't know your life well enough to know how you might live it out, but I know that I've done that. I know that I've chased after the wind in this way. That recently I had the the wonderful opportunity to be able to start seminary. And it's been amazing. I love it. It's, It's been something that people from this church and people from this community have supported me in such a way that I could begin uh, to do seminary. And when I started, I decided that what I was going to do is I was going to do full-time work and I was going to do full-time seminary. Because I I think I'm a pretty smart guy. I I have a lot of confidence in my big old brain. And so I decided what I'm going to do is I'm going to do everything full time. 
And here was the issue. It worked. Our ministry here at FPC, the youth ministry that I was working in, grew. And there was depth in people's faith that was growing. And at the same time, I got all my work done and I held a 4.0. But what I found was that I lost out on the ability to rest. I was holding on to two handfuls and toil and I wasn't getting paid anymore. I wasn't making any more money. I wasn't living lavishly. I had two handfuls in toil in a one-bedroom apartment in Maple Shade, New Jersey. You don't need to have excess or luxury to be in living this life of two handfuls in toil. You need to be reaching out for more than you can really hold. No better is the fool who crosses his arm than the fool who reaches out and tries to hold on to everything at the expense of their own rest, at the expense of their own joy, at the expense of their own family. So as you hear that, what two handfuls are you holding on to? Are you striving to get a promotion? Are you trying to get into Yale? Are you practicing a sport at the expense of rest? Are you being like me and trying to be a full-time worker and full-time dad and full-time student? I don't, I don't know what you might be doing, but when you do that, it comes at a cost. It comes at a cost, and, and the difficulty in American culture is that when you do those things, when you hold on to two handfuls and toil, people praise you for it. When you stay up all night to study for a test and you don't rest at all, people tell you what good grades you have. When you work extra hard and you stay extra late at the expense of your family, people tell you what great work ethic you have. When you're able to hold down a full-time job in full-time school, people tell you how smart you are. We live in a world that praises two handfuls and toil. We love a person who it seems like they can have it all, who it seems like they can hold on to everything. But if the teacher is to be believed, then nobody has it all. It's all smoke. It's all vanity. And everything has a cost. And that cost might be your mental stability. That cost might be your faith life. That cost might be your marriage. That cost might be your friendships. That cost might be your ability to just sit outside and enjoy the sun on your face. But when we reach after two handfuls and toil, it comes at a cost, and we find ourselves to be a fool. Six months ago, I was a fool. I held on to two handfuls and toil, and I found that I needed to let go a little bit of something in order for me to find rest in my life. And so I'm here to ask you, are you a fool today? I ask my wife if I'm allowed to ask a group of people if they're fools, but are you a fool today? Have you been a fool? Are you chasing after more than you can hold on to? And from this, the teacher turns and he shares something that is not smoke, something that has actual value one another. Throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, the teacher has been raising up small little pleasures like a good meal or the sun on your face that are things that have strong and actual value and are not smoke. And again, we see him turning to one more thing that is not smoke. It's companionship. It's being able to be with one another, and again, you might be able to see how he might have a prophetic word against American culture that considers an adult someone who's independent. Because the human was never intended to be independent, we were meant to be a community and interdependent. To be able to work together and live with one another. That alone, a person will struggle, but together they'll get some actual benefits that together they will get an increase from their labor, that they will get help, that they will get warmth, that they will get protection. And I love that the teacher lists out some of the benefits of community. Because sometimes those are the things that feel elusive, aren't they? Like, we can pretty easily say together as a group those things that you get from working harder, right? Like, that, that seems like very concrete things. If I work harder, I might get a promotion. If I work harder, I might get a raise. If I work harder, I might get a better grade. If I work harder, I might get into the school that I want. If I work harder, I might be able to accomplish the work that I'm intending to do, and it's good work that needs to be done. Pretty clearly, we can state the things that we get from working harder, but it feels more elusive to state the things that we get from things like a coffee with a friend. Things like lingering after church for a long conversation. Things like a vacation with our family that we don't check our work email on. It can be more difficult and more elusive to name the benefits of those things, but the teacher flips it on its head and says, no, working harder is smoke. Community has real value. Achievement, that's smoke. Wealth, that's smoke. Power, that's smoke. 
You try and grip those things, they're going through your fingers. Independence, that's smoke. To him, you want to know what's not smoke? Community. Us. One another. And he uses this journey language of two people who are on a journey together. And he says, if two people are on a journey together and one falls down, the other can help them up. It's pretty clear. If two people are on a journey together and it's cold at night, if they lay down next to each other, they can keep warm. It's pretty clear. If two people are on a journey together and someone attacks them, they can defend themselves, but if one person was on a journey on his own and he gets attacked, that guy is done. Like that guy is beaten up and everything's being taken from him. He uses this journey language to actually say how people flourish when we are with one another. And then he turns to a kind of weird phrase about a threefold or a three ply cord. And, and that phrase comes from an even older story called the Enuma Elish where there's two people who are on a journey together. And one guy, one adventurer, is about to go off on his own to what is presumably going to be his own glorious death to fight a battle that is larger than he can beat. And and what the story does is it doesn't uplift him for being a strong individual who's going to take care of his own stuff. Right? And how many action movies have you watched where the hero of the movie, normally a man, goes off and says, this is something I need to take care of on my own. But the Enuma Elish doesn't do that. What it does is his friend who's been with him says that a three-ply cord is not easily broken. That, and and this, this phrase probably became a wisdom statement that people used at that time. Similar to how you or I might say many hands make light work. A three-ply cord is not easily broken. He closes his argument by saying something that you and I already know. That if two people are stronger than one, then three people are going to be stronger than two. Simple addition. Brothers and sisters, I I want you to look around the room for a minute. I want you to look around the room for a minute. If if it helps, that happened in the first service too. I said, I want you to look around the room for a minute, and everyone just stared me down. Look around the room for a minute. I'm not the only one here. If two are stronger than one, and three are stronger than two, how much stronger again are 50? There is a moment in our service that I love more than anything else. It's the moment at the end of our service where we join hands for the benediction. And here's why. Because in my family, when we got together around the dinner table, we prayed beforehand. And when we prayed, we did what? We held hands. And, And I love that moment because you find that the church, which is normally organized into rows and pews where everyone looks at me, starts to turn around and reach for someone they can hold on to. And the room creates one long snake where everyone's holding hands, and then maybe one person's off in a corner, and someone, like, reaches across the room, and there's always someone who is, like, stretched at their limit so that we can hold hands, and we have this moment in church that says one thing to me. This is a family. We hold hands for the benediction because we are a family together. We are a community that you can actually depend on. And as we've been going through our ways of the week, one of the ways applies really well here. It says this. It says, belong here. That as we at the end of our service hold hands and we make this statement about the family that we are, you have an invitation to belong here. To make this church, this community, your constant companion. To be the people who will hold your hands and lift you up. That on Sunday morning, Coming to church might not be the most productive thing, right? You might be able to catch up on some emails, be able to do some schoolwork, mow the lawn before it gets hot. I don't know what that looks like. You might think that there's something else that you can do, but when you do that, you miss on something marvelous that happens here, that the church of God gathers together and becomes one family. And I know that this is 4th of July weekend, and so we are a little bit light, but think for a minute about the larger church community that actually exists here at FPC. When someone joins this church and they become a new member, they stand in front of the community and they make some agreements and then we as a church stand in front of them. And we make an agreement to them as well that to the best of our ability, we will endeavor to support them in their life and in their faith. If if two are stronger than one and three are stronger than two, how much stronger then is a church of hundreds that is here to support each other and be with one another? And so here's what I have to say to you today. Are you struggling? Are you struggling with alcoholism or with pornography or with your own sexuality? We are a church who is here with you. 
Are you feeling underworked? Are you feeling overworked? Are you feeling exhausted? Are you feeling anxious? We're a church who is here with you. Are you enjoying a sunny day outside? Do you feel like everything is actually going your way? Do you feel like everything is working out for you and you are sharing life's moments with those around you? We are a church who is here with you. That in good moments and in bad, we are a church that you can belong to. And you will discover something, an amazing benefit of what it looks like to have hundreds of people who are on your side and who are with you. There are many things in this world which are smoke. There are many things that you can chase after but will not be there in the long term. One of the few things that will actually exist permanently is the body of Christ, our Christians, that on the final day, when Christ returns to gather up his followers and invite us to the feast, it is these people who you are about to hold hands with that you will spend your eternity with. Work might be smoke. Achievement might be smoke. Wealth might be smoke. But this community that exists here that will exist into eternity is not. And when we sit down at that table again with our Lord and Savior at the table, we'll hold hands. Just like we, oh, crying a little. Just like we hold hands today. Right? Because that is the faith community that we walk with. And my encouragement is this. In a small group, in brunch, in front yard fellowship, in inviting someone from this room that you don't really know all that well over for lunch or be more adventurous and over for dinner, you might be able to find a little bit of what God has for you in the community of faith. That when you choose to belong here and belong to one another, that you will receive a taste of heaven here on earth. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you that you are good and that you have given us good gifts. Lord, that this church is not our idea, but is your idea to be the family that supports one another and who is with one another. Lord, help us to belong. Help us to be honest, to be vulnerable, that we can be a people and a community that holds each other up through thick and through thin, through good and through bad. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Can you stand with us as we sing the final song? <clears throat> Great are you, Lord, mighty in strength. You are faithful, and you will ever be. We will praise you with all of our days. It's for your glory we offer everything. Raise your hands, all you nations. Shout to God, all creation, how awesome is the Lord most high. Where you send us, God, we will go. You're the answer, we want the world to know. We will trust you. When you call our name, will you lead us? We'll follow all the way. Raise your hands, all you nations. Shout to God, all creation. Yes, how awesome is the Lord Most High. And we will praise you together for now. Singing, hallelujah, hallelujah, how awesome is the Lord most high. Singing, hallelujah, 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 how awesome is the Lord most high. So raise your hand. All you nations shout to God, all creation. How awesome is the Lord most high! We will praise you together for now and forever. How awesome is the Lord most high! One more 
Raise your hands, all ye nations, shout to God, all creation, how awesome is the Lord most high. We will praise you together for now and forever, how awesome is the Lord most high. you all probably saw this coming, but would you join hands with your family? <laughs> Let's join hands together. Can I get in one of these? Thanks, y'all. Nice. Way to snake across the room, Jess. Appreciate it. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, make this family your family. Lord, that we would be one body of one mind, following after one Lord and in one spirit. Lord, unite us together and bind us together that through difficulties, through different theologies and different interpretations, that we can be a family who loves each other and who draws together. Lord, that we can be an image in this world of what a loving and caring community can look like despite differences. Lord, build us into your people that your light could shine through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.